So I had, I had a very interesting week. On Monday morning, I got a phone call that our dear brother, Julius Bryce, had passed. And that was my Monday morning. And I remember speaking with Julius only a while ago, a couple of weeks ago. And I can tell that he was kind of weak, but it's, it still came as a bit of a shock to me. And so we know that he didn't suffer. He went quickly and quietly. But I, I want us to all pray for his family. I want us to pray for them to get over the shock and the loss. So I want to tell you something. When I was 12 years old, for the entire year, my knees hurt. Like right above at the top of my shin where the two bones were. I had this aching pain. Because when I was 12 years old, I was six feet tall. But when I was 10 years old, I was five foot six. So I grew six inches in two years. So I went from being this tall to about this tall. And it caused some pressure on my knees. That was literally, literally growing pains. So we were at the, uh, I was at the convention on Friday and Saturday. And I went to a workshop on church growth. And the challenge for any organization, any person that's growing is that there's always growing pains. Our parish is evolving, our parish is growing. And there's always some kind of stress associated with growing things. And when we think about Jesus, do we ever think about Jesus' own growth? Or do we just think of Jesus coming on earth as a fully developed preacher of the gospel? The good thing about the church is that we go through all the Gospels. We go through the whole Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We cycle through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we always have some John every year. So in this year, we're at Mark. And Mark is believed to be the shortest of the, is the, shortest of the gospel, Gospels, and it is the first Gospel. And at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to send my messenger ahead of you. And he's going to prepare the way. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. That's how Mark's gospel began. And then we find John the Baptist. You remember this? This is Mark 1. We find John the Baptist in Mark 1. He's in the River Jordan, and he's baptizing folks. And they say the entire Judean countryside came out to be baptized by John the Baptist. He had a baptism of repentance. Confess your sins out loud, be baptized, repent, and move on with your life. And so I can see lines and droves and droves of people getting baptized, one at a time, by John the Baptist. But then Jesus got baptized. And was Jesus' baptism like everybody else's? Do we remember Jesus' baptism? We talked about this a few weeks ago about baptism. Mm -hmm. Jesus was baptized. And the skies opened up. And the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, descended upon Jesus like a dove. And something happened to Jesus. It's as if his eyes opened up. And he saw things clearly. And scripture tells us that he was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And what happened in the wilderness? He was tempted by the devil for how long? 40 days. We got a 40 day period coming up, don't we? We got Lent coming up. We have, we have Ash Wednesday coming up on February 18th. And I want everybody, I'm asking everybody, to open their hearts and their minds and their spirits to be transformed this Lent. I want us to have a real Lent. I want us to 
do whatever God is telling us to do, to let go of whatever God is telling us to let go, to pick up whatever God is telling us to pick up, to allow ourselves to be purified. We're going to make some changes in our liturgy. We're going to have a Wednesday night service. I want folks here this Wednesday. I want folks to come for these Wednesday night uh, uh, events that we're going to have on Lent. And I want us to be changed. I want us to feel this Lent. And I want us to feel Holy Week. And I want us to be transformed. Because Jesus was transformed. Something happened to Jesus out there dealing with that temptation. And Jesus came out of that wilderness a new person, a new man. And he walked around, he walked along the seashore, and he saw a couple of fishermen. He saw two brothers. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew. He said, come along with me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then he saw the sons of Thunder, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. He said, follow me. And so there he is with his four friends. And they don't know exactly what Jesus is all up to. And a lot of times we don't understand exactly what Jesus is up to. What is Jesus doing in your life right now? What is Jesus calling you into? What kind of mission does Jesus have for you? I can imagine his four friends having an open mind and an open heart and excited about the journey. Because brothers and sisters, we are on a journey. We may just think that this is a set little time and take our time here for granted, but this is a journey. This is a beautiful journey. Let us be transformed like Simon, like Andrew, like James, like John. And Jesus walked into the synagogue at Capernaum. You have any idea what the synagogue, synagogue at Capernaum looked like? on the front page of the book. The remains are. That's what's, that's what's left now. But Jesus walked into the synagogue in Capernaum. I can see him open up the scroll and read it. But he didn't read it like the scribes did. You know, I can see scribes opening up the scroll and saying, well, it was written that blah, blah. Jesus, Jesus didn't, 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 didn't speak like that. <laughs> Jesus spoke with authority. Jesus spoke like he was the one who wrote that stuff on the scroll. And they looked at each other like, look at this guy. He's preaching with authority. And just then something interesting happened. A man with an unclean spirit. What does it mean to have an unclean spirit? A lot of us think that when we hear about the concept of an unclean spirit, like was he filled with demons? Was he possessed? What does it mean to have an unclean spirit? You know, sometimes different spirits get into all of us. Sometimes a spirit of fear gets into and that spirit of fear doesn't come along, does it? It doesn't come by itself. It comes with a spirit of anxiety and a spirit of, of lack. Like, look at my life, it's not good enough. And a, a spirit of stress. All of these kind of come together. When that spirit of fear comes, when that unclean spirit comes, you know, we're not thankful for things. We, we get our minds clouded and we become overwhelmed by life. When that spirit gets in us, it's easy for us to look out, look to connect with folks with similar spirits. You know, when you, when you ever see, you ever read the term that birds of a feather flock together? Can you see somebody with that unclean spirit saying, man, life is hard. I'm so afraid. It's not going to work. Then you see somebody that's like, yeah, it's not going to work. Look at you. Don't you understand what's going on. And so, those spirits feed on each other, and that negativity grows. But that spirit saw Jesus. He said, Jesus, what did you come here to do? Did you come here to destroy us? I 
know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And what did Jesus do? Did Jesus get down there and have a wrestling match with the uh, unclean spirit? Did, did Jesus do a special dance? Did Jesus rip his shirt? Oh, please leave. How did Jesus handle that unclean spirit? <coughs>
Jesus walked among us and lived as one of us and embraced us. He spoke of authority, the authority of God. And right now, Jesus is still walking with all of us. So when we have those moments of fear and foreboding, of anxiety and worry, like, oh, I don't have enough. Look how much somebody else has. Oh, my life is too hard. It's too heavy. I hear Jesus saying to me, Raymond, shut up and get that spirit out of you. When I worry about my church and my people, I hear Jesus, shut up and get out of there. You see, brothers and sisters, when you feel that life is heavy, hear that voice of Jesus speaking to you. Shut up and get out of there. That spirit of fear, shut up and get out of there. That spirit of lack, shut up and get out of there. In my car ride today, as I came to church, my son, Raymond, analyzed my preacher's style. He said, well, what you do is you say a story from your past and when you grew up, <laughs> you say something about the gospel. <laughs> then you say something to give people some hope. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's all I got to say. <laughs> if you don't remember anything else from this sermon, remember this. That those spirits of fear and worry and anxiety and all kinds of negativity that we carry in our lives cannot exist in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's all I have to say. Amen. Amen. I'm ready, Larry. I'd like to pray for you.